Almost a century and a half after the persecution of innocent women and men in Salem, Massachusetts, Tennessee had its only witch trial, with symptoms eerily similar to those of the affected so-called victims of perceived witchcraft in Salem. One woman, under the influence of two cunning men, would blame her neighbor for bewitching her. Everyone involved in the Wizard of Finchers County's arrest would regret their decisions, even as he passed into obscurity. Cunning folk were faith healers that practiced folk medicine and thwarted alleged witches by removing their curses. In 19th century Finchers County, Tennessee, County Surveyor Isaac William Taylor and his son, the blacksmith Pleasant Taylor, were celebrated for their skill in putting witches to flight by using methods to return perceived hexes back to the person who was believed to have cast the malicious spells. It is interesting to note that blacksmiths were long believed to be folk healers, but were sometimes regarded with suspicion by the communities that they served. During the fall of 1830, the father and son duo would confront their most diabolical case. Several women around the Clark Ranch community began exhibiting odd symptoms that defied medical explanation of the time. They all seemed to lose control of their bodies and suffered violent jerking and trembling. By January, they had all recovered, except for Rebecca French, who seemed to suffer more tremors than the others. By the standards of the time, Rebecca was considered a spinster. She was an unmarried woman approaching 40 years old and was living at home with her parents. Her father, Joseph French, was a Revolutionary War veteran, originally from Virginia, who had become a lawyer in South Carolina and purchased 600 acres of land in the community in 1807. He called on the Taylors, desperate for any help. After examining Rebecca and concluding that her symptoms were the result of black magic, suspicion immediately fell on one of Joseph's neighbors, a strange man by the name of Joseph Stout. Although the only Stout recorded in the county's 1820-1830 censuses is William Stout, who is not found in the 1840 census, but was a neighbor to the French family. Stout was a mystery to everyone in the community. He was an aging gentleman who lived in a small house by himself on the eastern bank of the Old Bay River. He was quiet, didn't attend church, and only had a few friends. He didn't talk much when he went to town either. He also wore a sort of belt, described as kind of rope of buckeye nuts. Carrying one buckeye nut wouldn't have been strange. Others would even carry the mitten-shaped sassafras leaf on their person to make money go further. In Appalachian folklore, carrying a buckeye was said to relieve joint pain and arthritis as well as provide strength and vigor. Hardly anything is known about Stout, but it is possible that being so self-sufficient was starting to take its toll on him. Although, the belt he wore still raised more than a few eyebrows and soon get him into trouble with the majority of the community. His fate was sealed as soon as he decided to pay a visit to his neighbors to see how Rebecca was doing. As soon as he entered the home, Rebecca's symptoms grew much worse. Mysteriously, she saw Stout as some sort of healer and pled with him to give her his belt. After some hesitation, he handed it to her. She wrapped it around her waist and her symptoms subsided. He decided it was best for him to leave. Seeing these events unfold and under the influence of the Taylors, her father immediately accused Stout of using witchcraft against his daughter. Having already been told how a supposed witch could remove the curse, both father and daughter begged Stout to recite the appropriate prayer. Rebecca even grabbed at his hands, trying to find relief. When Stout tried to leave, a struggle ensued. Even though Rebecca's father hit Stout with a heavy chair, the man was able to flee back to his own home. Allegedly, as soon as he left with his belt, Rebecca's symptoms returned. The community would immediately turn against Stout. Joseph French quickly rode to see a gentleman named Charles Stanton. He told the man what had transpired in his home earlier and demanded that Stout be brought back to his home. When Stout arrived back at Rebecca's bedside, he was accompanied by the Charleses and five men who forced him inside with rifles loaded with silver bullets. Rebecca's father was accompanied by the Taylors. At that time, it was believed that the silver bullets were the only way to kill someone who was said to be in the league with the devil. However, the Taylors wanted what they thought would be irrefutable proof in the eyes of the courts that Stout had used a curse on the women of the community. The Taylors gave simple instructions on how the curse could be lifted. Each of the armed men would take turns holding Rebecca's hands while they said, God of heaven, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, bless you. It was recorded that the prayer uttered by each of the armed men had no effect. However, when Stout held her trembling hands and said the prayer, Instantly, it would seem she was completely cured. 
Rebecca's nightmare may have ended, but Joseph's was just beginning. She asked the Charleses to obtain a warrant for Stout's arrest. Immediately, the men left her in the care of her father and marched Stout, still at gunpoint, to the home of community judge Abraham Carruthers. Along the prosecuting attorney, John B. McCormick, Stout was placed under arrest and was transported to the county seat of Jamestown, about 20 miles away. Upon arrival, he was brought before County Magistrate and Justice of the Peace Joshua Owens. Prosecuting Attorney McCormick had accompanied the group to the courthouse and had explained everything to the judge. Judge Owens referred to Stout as a wizard, and his bail was set at then astronomical price of $2,000. Stout was placed in jail, cell by himself, because rumors about his diabolical talents had already started to spread in Jamestown. Allegedly, according to rumor, he could control the minds of people and animals from up to 15 miles away and that he could move through keyholes, so the guards felt like they had to be on high alert. Some even melted their silver coins to turn them into bullets, just in case the wizard was to pour himself through the bars of his cell. Other tales said Stout collected animal parts for his witchcraft. Most important to him, according to folklore, was the giant salamander called the Hellbender. Missouri State Herpetologist Jeff Brigler encapsulated the superstition surrounding the salamander by saying that early settlers thought the Hellbender looked like a creature from hell where it was bent on returning, and that its loose skin looked like souls being tormented in purgatory. Some people believe that the bite of a hellbender was venomous and that parts from it could be used to create harmful spells. Despite all of the accusations, fortune finally shone on Stout when, during his hearing in February of 1831, Rebecca didn't show up for trial, causing Judge Owens to order her to pay court costs. Prosecuting Attorney McCormick refused to proceed with Joseph's indictment, which caused an immediate uproar in the courthouse. Stout was released, but he wasn't done with the men who had started this nightmare. He would later take out warrants for assault and battery and false imprisonment against Joseph French, the Taylors, Staunton, and five men who held him at gunpoint. Their trials took place in May 1831, and only one person was found guilty. Rebecca was called as a witness to recall the events. Her father, Joseph French, pled guilty. He said that he hadn't believed in witchcraft until he saw his daughter suffering, and then he admitted to hitting Stout with a chair. Pleasant Taylor pled guilty, only saying that he believed in witchcraft. Isaac Taylor, Pleasant's father, however, pled not guilty. He thought his defense was rock solid. Judge Owens didn't agree. Isaac said as the evidence that witchcraft was real, that he had shot a deer with the right side towards him, that it fell at the crack of the gun, and when he examined the carcass, he found the ball had entered the left side and lodged against the skin of the right side. He then argued that everything that was done to Stout was completely legal, because King Henry VIII's English Conjuration Act of 1604 was still in Tennessee books as law. With so many Revolutionary War soldiers still alive, it's little wonder that the judge found the older cunning man guilty. Isaac wasted no time in appealing. Judge Abraham Carruthers presided over the arguments. Isaac presented his defense. Again, Judge Carruthers upheld the conviction, saying that the law against witchcraft was destructive of, repugnant to, or inconsistent with the freedom and independence of this state and form of government. The older cunning man only spent a short time in prison, though. Due to public opinion, everyone in the community seemed to believe that Stout was in league with the devil himself. So the man vanished into obscurity after selling his home. It would seem that Rebecca's symptoms never returned and she soon married an Irish-born man named Isaac Johnson and the couple moved to Pulaski County, Georgia seven years after the trials. Her father, Joseph, passed away in his home. This caused her to sever ties with the county completely, just as Stout had done. In 1905, records from the trial were destroyed in a fire that broke out in the courthouse leaving only newspaper articles, memoirs, biographies, and folklore as our only source of information. If the Wizard of Overton County did go by William, his resting place may still be in the county. A marker for William Stout, born 1789 in North Carolina, stands in the privately owned All Red Cemetery and lists his death in 1865. However, this gentleman was married to Mary Ann Bowman, and their first child, Leonard Stout, was born in 1821. This is far from the tales of the solitary hermit recorded in regional tales. 
But don't we need to believe our suspected witches to be on the fringes of society, isolated and alone, with so much time on their hands that they turn to infernal contracts with diabolical forces?